ESV says, I walk in a wide place. Well, I understand that. It's the difference of riding, driving on a six-lane highway or walking on a narrow footpath. I mean, there's a lot more liberty when you're driving on a six-lane highway than just kind of, you know, wander and drift and put some on the highway. And so he, that's, the word technically is a wide place. But it translates well when we say, I will walk in liberty, for I seek your precepts. And, and to many of us, this is kind of an oxymoron. How, how, how do we find more liberty when we're seeking the precepts and the laws and the commandments of God? Doesn't that make us more restricted? But Jesus says this, and, and I really, I love this, that uh, uh, Jesus says to us in Luke chapter 4, uh, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Why is it that people who are not Christians typically see Christianity as being restrictive, being regulatory, being very confined? When Jesus himself says, God has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. You see, we, we, we've got this wrong. People who look at the Christians, they don't understand what it means to be free from the bondage and the slavery that sin keeps us in. And what it means then to, to have sight. When, when you're blind, you can walk anywhere you want to. You really can. And, and not be responsible for it because you can't see where you're going. Right? But when you've got eyes, when you've got eyes, you're free to see all that's around you and choose the right path to go. We've been delivered from blindness. We've been, our eyes have been opened. We can see, we have this liberty, we've been set at liberty, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You, you, you see, sin would have dominion over us. Sin would crush us. It's sin that keeps us away from that freedom that God would give to us. It's the truth of God that brings true and lasting freedom. Here's what John says in, uh, in chapter 8. Uh, Jesus was talking to the Jews who had believed him. These are believing Jews. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's a great freedom, a great liberty that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. Yes, we're like trains on the track. But thank God for the tracks that give us the moon. You see, we've been beguiled by the promises of sin. The sin promises freedom, but it's fake. False teachers make these false promises. Second Peter chapter 2, it says in verse 18, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh. Those who are barely escaping from those who live in terror. They promise them freedom, but they, even, they themselves are slaves of corruption. And whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. We talk about being slaves of righteousness. If we're overcome with righteousness, then that's what, that's what we serve. The conclusion is this. There are several more things that that uh, Psalm 119 talks about. But I, I want to go uh, immediately to the question that it is whether what we know to be true actually lines up with what we live and do. What we know to be true, does it actually line up with what we say and what we do? Yes, we should trust God's word, shouldn't we? We say that we trust and we value God's word. Why? God himself speaking to us. It's his law. It's, it's, it's himself. It's him expressing himself. God 
expressing his desires in his heart to us through his word, providing his guidance. Yes, we say then that we want to do this. But let me ask you these questions. Do we genuinely seek for answers to life from God's word? Or do we seek it from our friends, our neighbors, professors, colleagues, family members? Do we genuinely seek answers from God's word? Now, it may be that God brings somebody into his life, but I'm saying there's, there's got to be a lining up here. We can't be listening to someone who's giving us counsel that goes opposed and different from God's word. It, and, and listen, let me say, there's, there's even religious institutions that claim to be Christians but don't follow God's word. They have placed the institution of the church and the organization above the teaching of God's word to where they, they actually interpreted for us. I can't exactly agree with that. One of those, one of the things, uh, for example, well, we believe that Jesus is the mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. But there's religions that teach that there's other, other ways. One of the largest religions teaches us that you have to go through marriage. There's the, there's the Mormon religion that teaches you need to go through a guy named Joseph Smith. And, and there's other ways. Some teach that you have to go through uh, uh, Buddha. I'm simply saying that even religious institutions, we have to be careful that they line up. And why don't we say this? You need to be careful that what you do in your life lines up not with the preacher or the pulpit, but with God's word. You need to hold me accountable so that we're in God's word. This is the, the paramount standard. The real question is whether or not we really live what we say. Do we believe and apply the answers that we find in God's word? And how do we hold God's word as a standard? Do we hold it as the highest standard, or is God's word subject to the standards of science, the standards of common thinking, standards of uh, philosophy? Who, where do we hold the standard of God's word? So I leave you with this. This is the verse that we need to memorize, that we need to memorize for next week. Psalm 119, verses 30 and 31. Choose to follow God. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, let me not be put to shame. Choose to follow God. It's a choice we have to make. And today, today is the best day to make that choice. Today is the day you can say, you know, dear God, as I sit here in this chair, I realize that I've been straying, wandering, maybe to the left, maybe to the right. God, bring me back to your path. Teach me your commandments. Show me your way. Make, make me to obey your commandments. Help me to understand and have that wisdom. That would be the prayer of our heart to say, Lord, this is my greatest desire. That I would be like this psalmist who's consumed and caught up with the things of God. Our Father, today as we come to you, we, we, we are truly a blessed people that God should speak to us. But please forgive us for not listening. Please forgive us for not, not just being enthralled with what you have to say. And not only that, forgive us. We're not seeking out answers that we need to like, we're not fine. Letting you speak to us and then following you in, in, in obedience. I pray, dear God, that as we see the Word of God, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't allow other things to, to keep us from falling into line with teaching in the Word of God. We pray that it would be the ministry of your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name.